today we follow up our last video taking a look at a repeat creator by looking at another repeat creator. This time we're going to take a look at a new SRD from Penflower Inc. So join us as we dive into that today. <laughs> Hello everybody and thank you all for joining us again here today on Hessens County for another SRD talk. This video series takes a look at system reference documents and other types of creative materials that you can utilize to potentially jumpstart your own uh, TTRPG creations. So uh, today we're going to be diving, as I mentioned, into an, a new SRD created by Pinflower Inc. aka uh, Tom Fomo. Uh, this one being... Passkey. Uh, just to dive straight into sort of licensing and all of that information, the Passkey system uh, is uh, licensed under the uh, Creative Attribution 4.0 International License. Um, so obviously that means that you have to use uh, that. Um, you can go ahead and use it as long as you provide attribution to uh, Pinflower Inc., uh, and there is specific language that you will find here on page three of the sort of fancy version of the SRD um, that, of course, outlines all of the various information here. And, of course, it says this means that you can create games, expansions, and hacks based on the passkey system, both for personal and commercial use. Another thing I want to go ahead and jump into real quick is to go ahead and just do a quick shout out to notify everybody. There is already a game jam on itch.io for this, so a link to that will be found in the doobly-doo down below, along, of course, with links to the actual pass key uh, system and information about it. So, um, so yes, anyway, let's go ahead and dive into exactly what the objectives are, which are kind of outlined here to a certain extent on page two, but I'll just kind of give my own personal summary of some of the important key elements that I found not only on this page, but also just like in the SRD in general. So the first thing passkey tries to be is a generic system that is intended to be sort of easier to understand and quite adaptable to a variety of different settings uh, and also make it adaptive for cooperative solo and guided games. So, of course, by cooperative, I mean like basically GM-less games. Uh, solo, of course, being like just imagine like your 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 typical like let's say iron sworn experience right um and then of course your traditional guided uh ttrpg with a game master or whatever the system the passkey system really tries to maximize essentially the players uh, and the a game master or creator or whoever uh maximize their creative options and it mainly does this by focusing on three main things uh, the uh, player agency uh, by putting as many possible options for uh, problem solving or 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 conflict resolution um, or other things like that in the hands of the players. The second thing is to uh, again in order to make it adaptive to a wide number of uh, settings and storytelling types, you have to, of course, maximize your customization. Um, not only for the creator who might be adapting the system, but also for the players themselves so that they can, in turn, um, adapt their style of character that they would prefer to play to the set setting and system themselves. Finally, uh, there is a strong focus, I feel, in narrative more narrative styles of role play uh, in this. And by narrative, of course, I mean a focus more on story and non-combat conflict resolution. Um, you can, of course, utilize combat through this system, uh, but it's not central to the sort of creative aspects of this system um, and would probably feel pretty bland if you were relying on this in order to, like simulate combat as opposed to it being like uh, two or three rolls and then you're done sort of a thing in order to make this simple and also to increase player agency a it uses a minimal amount of math um relying on basically the use of either points or six-sided dice in order to resolve situations um and also uh like I said, it's there's 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 that choice of either spending tokens in order to try to resolve things or leaving things up to chance, the dice. 
Um, so there's two different options there for the player, which of course increases their agency. And also uh, the modifications to that role can of course uh, maximize your sort of character customization because it gives you options of utilizing points in different ways or stuff like that. So let's go ahead and dive a bit deeper into some of the mechanics of this system so you can see how it might work in uh, a game that you might want to create. So here on these two pages, you will actually see pretty much all of the core rules of the system, or at least a very significant portion of them. So um, as uh, we, so first thing, uh, first thing I wanted to kind of cover is action resolution. So basically, all of the information you can see here on the bottom half of this first column and the top half of this second column. So. Um, Actions, of course, are anything that our player characters are doing that can fail or have consequences. Obviously, if you're doing a thing and there really aren't any consequences to your failure, then, I mean, obviously, you could potentially roll to see if it happens or not, but if it doesn't happen, then, well, you know, oh well. Um, it's not worth spending points on and stuff. So, anyway, as I mentioned earlier, basically, a, whenever a player... Whenever a character is doing an action, the player running that character has two options. One, they can spend uh, energy points, essentially, uh, uh, tokens, th from a pool which is associated with one of the four statistics. Stats, rather. Um, which, in a sort of default, the passkey system utilizes stamina, dexterity, wits, and sociability. Each of these four stats has a pool, um, and as your character does stuff, you can potentially spin from these four different energy pools. Uh, spending three points will get them a total success. Uh, spending two points will get them a partial success, so with one complication, and just one point will get them a weak success um, with two potential complications. This will feel very familiar to with anybody who has utilized some of uh, the Pinflower Inc. some of Pinflower Inc.'s previous systems, but also anyone who's played, for example, the Cipher system, um, where you can potentially spend points in order to make certain roles a lot easier, um, to the point of basically being auto successes, right? Um, or some other systems that rely solely on. Uh, point spending in order to accomplish tasks. Now, when you rely on luck, all you need to do is roll a single d6. And you look at this chart here that you can see um, uh, on the page where basically um, you have a 50-50 chance of success or failure. So uh, you have various different degrees of failure where you could get uh, a number of different complications, which of course would be unexpected problems, challenges, and obstacles that are resulting from your from your action. Uh, of course, some of these uh, complications could be inflicting your character with certain conditions or other characters with certain conditions. Or they could be narrative different things that happen in the game um, that could have an impact on, the, of course, the storyline or what your character is trying to do. Like, not only you fail, but you, you could be, make it harder to succeed later. The 50% chance of a success, uh, we have the standard sort of total success, a partial success, uh, or success with consequences, because you still get a complication. Um, and then there is another one where you could gain a success, but also get the inspired condition, which the inspired condition is actually described over here in the third column. And it says, just to read it for you, after witnessing or hearing something moving or encouraging, the PC gains advantage on their next action of choice. This condition stacks. We mentioned it can give you an advantage. Presumably, certain consequences would also potentially give you a disadvantage, right? Like, for example, hindered, uh, which would give you disadvantage on any roles that might uh, be affected by your hindrance, like being restrained, obviously, that means that stamina or dexterity rolls are going to be a problem. The advantage basically means that you just add one to your roll if you're rolling, or you just reduce the EP cost by one. So if I uh, am inspired, 
because of a previous successful luck roll, then I only have to spend two points to get a total to get a total success instead of three. Um, if I have a disadvantage, then again it, that kind of does the opposite. You either remove one from your you subtract one from your from your luck roll or you add one to your EP cost. So again, if I want that total success, I got to spend four points instead of three. Um, uh, it says here that both disadvantages and advantages can stack. So if I have uh, several conditions all at the same time, that could make it practically impossible for me to do anything in this moment or make the cost so high that it would be very difficult for me to, 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 to actually succeed. Um, so as I mentioned, we have our stats pulls with our four different stats. Um, when you are creating a character, uh, this is of course one of the first things that you'll do is determine exactly how big your effort or energy pools are for each of these four stats. Um, normally it is recommended that your starting pool is going to be 46 that you then divide up between the four pools at, at your at your basically at, at the player's decision. Another thing that could potentially affect whether you get advantage or disadvantage on a roll are skills and flubs. So again, when you are creating a character, uh, you are going to gain uh, a set of skills that will give your player advantage on a roll, but also you will gain a set of flubs. And flubs basically are the opposite of skills. They're things that your character is just generally not that great at doing. Um, and these are things that will give your character a disadvantage in certain situations. Maybe uh, my character is uh, a skilled dancer. So, you know, certain types of movements or, 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 or maybe even certain types of... Uh, types of move movements related to certain types of martial arts that are very fluid and dance-like and dynamic, maybe that gives me an advantage. Maybe my character is just really bad at directions, right? Maybe my character does has a really bad sense of direction, so it's really easy for them to get lost. They have a hard time finding their way. They have a hard time picturing uh, sort of spatial things in their mind, so it's hard for them to remember exactly where certain things are in relation to one another and stuff like that. So that could potentially be a flub that would hinder uh, or give me disadvantage on roles when it comes to finding certain things that I have left and then come back for or again finding my way or, or things like that. One or two more things that can potentially uh, impact you know, uh, roles or the specific dynamic actions of things going on uh, would be uh, traits. So these are an optional thing uh, that are generally uh, recommended if you're introducing like in your in your in your game where you have multiple sorts of species or different types of folks that exist like your your standard sort of uh, traditional fantasy game where of course you've got elves and dwarves and all that stuff right the you know if you have something like that or if you're playing a sci-fi game with lots of aliens and stuff maybe there are certain innate biological or physiological characteristics that different characters are going to have that are different from one another then you you know like i say as opposed to a game where everybody's generally on the same physical and biological level like let's say in uh, a story where everybody's a human or everybody's an orc or whatever um, <laughs> um so anyway yeah so essentially you basically your your creator so presumably you would be creating a list of traits that each of these different playable species or folk would have um or you could let your player, uh, you could provide a list of traits and have your player sort of mix and match traits or potentially use the traits that you suggest and provide in order to base their own. Um, a number of these traits presumably would also provide uh, advantages or disadvantages in a similar fashion that we had with skills and flubs, except um, in this case, it's a lot less um linear and, and suggestive uh it could go either way um so for example uh a character who's playing an alien who's well adapted to swimming um 
probably would have a disadvantage when they're doing certain actions like stamina on a desert planet um, because they're just not adapted for that. Uh, While they would obviously have an advantage or might not even need to roll uh, when they're doing certain, you know, swimming activities or uh, stuff involving water uh, and things like that. Um, So, uh, yeah, generally it's recommended that if you are including traits in your system because of the need for those different types of things, uh, that a character have like roughly three or four different traits. If your characters are involved in a situation where the, um, the high risk situation essentially that we were talking about with our action is potentially like dangerous or life threatening, um, then, uh, this, like, for example, if you're trying to solve a problem involving hazard, like let's say a fire or, uh, there's an opponent. And again, they, it could also be like a verbal or a psychological combat. It doesn't have to actually be physical combat. Uh, so again, this could be a debate or, um, you know, like a, a political discussion, or this could be, um, some sort of psychic something or other, or um, basically you're trying to break each other down like a, uh, like an interrogation uh, or something along those lines. Um, in these cases, uh, these are referred to as tight spots, uh, which in this case we're going to rely on turns as opposed to just kind of free flow play. Um, uh, you know, uh, wh- who goes first could be determined. Uh, really, de- it really depends on what the creator kind of wants to do. But it's generally suggested that whoever initiates has the first turn, um, and uh, unless there's something weird going on, and then basically the order of actions uh, or, or or effects could be either determined by the GM or uh, a roll table or whatever the 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 threat of the uh, the character is. Essentially. Uh, what happens is that uh, each player character during their turn can potentially uh, perform up to two actions. So again, this is pretty similar to you know action point mechanics in a lot of role playing games, um, and these could of course could include moving, uh, inflicting, or at least attempting to inf- inflict a harmful condition on something, or trying to evade a harmful condition. Um, and then there are sort of threat roll tables. So depending upon how dangerous the threat is, um, basically uh, your PCs or the uh, or could potentially be harmed. Um, so stress again is 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 another optional system, just like the traits. When in which case, basically, you accumulate stress to a certain extent, and then that triggers a panicked condition. Um, or uh, you could also utilize essentially a style of stress that could potentially build up and then uh, uh, end up resulting in, I guess, the herd condition uh, is another option that you could play that. Or also there's, there's uh, uh, you know, armor, that, which is a type of equipment that can take certain hits. Uh, so that could also um, potentially uh, cause things to, to, to be affected. Um, there are also optional rules that exist here uh, for special items or for trade. Um, and there is a rule for resting. Um, so again, since we have energy energy or effort points in stat pools, that means that resting of course is really important to, in order to recover those points, uh, whenever the GM or the players feel that it's appropriate for the characters to have rested, uh, whether you spent a certain amount of time in downtime or because you're actively making an effort to rest, essentially what would account as like a short or medium term rest in some other RPGs, you would roll a, D, a 1d6 and then add those points to your pulls. There are also uh, pretty basic uh, progression rules you could either uh, increase your maximum pool stat, so basically roll a d6 and then add that d the results of that d6 to uh, distribute the points amongst your different stat pools. So, for example, if I rolled a four, then I could add one point to all of them, or two points to two of them, or so on and so forth. Um, and again, it's generally encouraged that uh, that the 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 group or the GM could potentially award. Um, uh, you, you know, if it, it basically a player who like role plays really well, or who, um, who did a lot of, uh, basically kind of create like a short list of maybe some, some, some things that you want to encourage in the game, uh, like amusing things, um, or, uh, 
uh, helping and engaging other players a lot, uh, either actively in game because their character is helping the other characters, or maybe um, helping other players who are not familiar with role playing games, or making suggestions, or being a, just basically being a good player. Potentially awarding these things with an extra d6 of of uh, you know maximum points for their stat pool. Another option, of course, is to add a new skill or a flub or change one. Uh, so essentially, you would either add or replace a skill or a flub. Uh, as long as it's narratively consistent uh, with what's been happening in the game or with their character. Uh, and of course, it is possible, I guess, that you could potentially, th there are of course potentially narrative assets that your character could gain um, that would either enable certain things in play um, or maybe like some weird special piece of equipment that allows, that essentially acts kind of like a skill or a potentially a trait. Uh, a trait is another option. So again, as I mentioned, creating a character is incredibly, is in some ways incredibly easy, but in other ways more difficult. Um, incredibly easy because there's only a couple of steps. Difficult in that um, unless the game creator, unless the person who's creating a game based on the system provides a number, a wide number of options, your players are going to have to kind of come up with their own options. Um, which could be complicated for them if they're not necessarily used to basically having a wide amount of choice. So as we just mentioned, a quick run through of character creation. Again, you roll 46 to create your stat pools to create the amount that you then add to your stat pools. Um, uh, depending upon the tone or the setting of the game or the way your characters, the way they, your, your, your GM wants to run the game, of course, you might have them roll maybe 3d6 or maybe 6d6 you know it depends um then the player will come up with or pick from various lists provided three starting skills and two flubs just as a reminder skills give your character advantage whenever you're doing certain things related with that skill flubs give your character disadvantages uh, another option of course is that you could include some sort of a, for for a game creator is that you could include like classes or backgrounds professions essentially playbooks um that actually might not be a bad way to kind of go about it is to basically to provide playbooks which might give you um maybe a, a, a range or distribution of different stat distributions that would make sense with that skill or that 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 class or profession uh and then maybe a list of i don't know eight skills and six flubs that you might want to pick from that are could be associated with that with of course options to add extras um then of course your player could potentially have uh cr basically create a list of um, any sort of special items that might be that they might have or other elements of equipment that would make sense. Again, this is another thing that might make sense that um, uh, that might be aff affiliated or related to a uh, different types of classes um, or professions. Um, and again, also, you might want to potentially create some rules where a character has to have a certain level of stat in order to be able to use an equipment. So, for example, uh, when we were on the previous page that was listing out these different types of armor, you'll see that they uh, that, um, um, you know, just as an example, there were different um, levels of stamina that or or different other flags or triggers that the character had to have in order to be able to utilize that type of armor essentially marking out that your character has to have a certain level of fitness in order to be able to effectively wear and use it and also um suggesting a level of proficiency um that might be required so here for example requiring for medium and a heavy armor that the uh, character has to have some form of a combat skill uh, suggesting that they've been trained before they could use it. Uh, of course, then you've got names and pronouns and all the various physical descriptions uh, and stuff, personality descriptions and things that you might want to include with that. Now, some other things that are kind of included in here as sort of either optional play or suggestions on, on ways that you might want to potentially build certain optional things into the game. I already mentioned stress and traits, uh, but another thing you might want to include as either a trait or a skill or both um, would be things like using magic or being a psychic or um, some other form of superpower or alien technology uh, that might... Uh, 
potentially impact play. Um, so uh, maybe there are certain skills, or this could even potentially be, it's not mentioned here, but one thing I could also potentially see is this being like an extra energy or effort pool that is specific for this thing that would allow uh, the player to potentially tap into this extra resource uh, to potentially influence certain actions um, separate of the uh, normal sort of action, but still have it pull from that 4d6 of, of stats. So it's reducing the other stat pools so that they don't, uh, in order to keep it relatively balanced. Um, but yeah, uh, so for example, you might have fantastical as a trait. So the trait could be that the, uh, the player character is born to be able to use magic, um, or they're, uh, you know, they, they're maybe they're a mutant like the like the X Men, but the fantastical also could baby could be learned. So essentially, it's a skill like being able to use alien technologies. Again, you could also combine these together. So, for example, maybe your character has the trait where they can potentially have an innate inherent magical ability like a sorcerer but you have to learn how to channel it properly so you can so you have that ability but you have to learn the skill in order to be able to use it or use it in certain ways uh, some other things that uh that uh Tom Fumo touches on in the uh in the pass key is of course modes of different play so whether you're playing cooperatively or solo or with a gm uh various ways that you can integrate uh safety rules and stuff into the game uh difficulty levels there is a wide number also included of resources so example traits complications um you know various uh Tr generators that can help you with prompts or with uh, creating fantastical descriptions of things. And then also uh, Tom Fumo includes uh, a number of like example characters and also a description of basic play utilizing this system. That was the passkey system. Again, just as a reminder, uh, this is a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. So, of course, you can use it anytime you want to create a game of your own. Links to the SRD can be found in the description down below. Uh, there is some uh, a number of logos that have been provided uh, for passkey games that would allow you to, of course, identify the fact that your game utilizes the passkey system so that people who are playing your game are aware, uh, especially if they have played a passkey game before, that this system is compatible, uh, at least roughly. Um, yeah, and again, as I mentioned, there's a jam going on right now, so if you wanted to use passkey to create a game, now would be a good time to do it. Uh, Don't forget to rate your itch purchases find the uh, find all the links in the description down below and like subscribe all that jazz and have a good song